Uh, so we're discussing uh, common source amplifier using the MOS transistor. And with all the biasing contraptions in place, this is what it looked like. So this is the part of the circuit that gives, uh, gives us the bias. And again, a quick recap. In case of an NMOS transistor, the VGS is the one that sets the voltage. As long as VGS is more than threshold voltage, the transistor is on. So the first thing to do is to ensure that the, uh, the VGS is higher than the threshold voltage. Uh, but also it's, uh, having VGS only higher than threshold voltage is not sufficient. We also know that there are conditions of saturation. There are conditions, uh, there is a certain requirement of the Y21 or the GM of the transistor that is necessary to get us some gain, right? So the, uh, the, the um, process to figuring out what VGS will be starts from the specifications of the gain, right? So when you have a small signal gain, you know small signal gain is GM times some R. Ideally, GM times the RL, right? So if I tell you that I need a gain of, let's say, 20 and RL is given, then you back calculate GM from there, Y21 from there of the transistor. And the GM, the expression of the GM itself contains the value of VGS, right? You have mu n C of W over L times VGS minus threshold voltage. So essentially from the value of the GM that you need, you will to figure out, you can get the uh, product of W over L times the V over drive. We have done this in case of PMOS transistor and the, and the, uh, and the um, and some of the assignments, exactly the same thing for an NMOS transistor. Now, when you have something like you have divided by L times some uh, two variables multiplied together gives you the same number, which means you should have infinite possible choices. But then we saw that in using the in, in the assignments that you have done before, uh, it, even though it sounds like in, infinite possible choices, it's not because there are other constraints to be met. For example, there can be constraints on keeping the transistor in saturation under the condition that uh, you have 100 millivolt input or 200 millivolt input and so on. So that imposes another limit. Uh, and uh, um, and using these two using these two conditions, you can actually figure out what the value of VGS will be. Okay. So now once you have if you know the value of VGS, the next step, this is all analytical, right? On a piece of paper. But once you have a uh, once you have figured out what the value of VGS will be, then you have to arrange some some way of uh, ensuring the transistor actually gets that VGS. Simplest way to do is to put a voltage source, but we know better that putting a voltage source is not sufficient because you cannot carry a voltage source for every transistor in the circuit, which essentially means that you have one mother voltage source from which you have to extract everything. So again, if you have a higher voltage source uh, than VGS, which typically is the case, then you can generate the value of that VGS by simply using a voltage divider, which is this R1, R2 uh, voltage divider that we that we saw. Right? So, and how do we choose the value of RD? We choose the value of RD uh, to some extent, to, uh, uh, I mean, to a, lot, to a large extent, the value of RD should be, in, at least should be such that, or uh, such that the transistor remains in saturation because if you keep on increasing the value of RD, the voltage drop across RD will increase for a fixed VDD, which essentially it will mean that the drain of the transistor, this is an NMOS transistor, so the drain of the drain voltage of the transistor will drop. And how long, I mean, to what extent can it drop? It can drop at most to that value so that the, threshold, the difference between the gate and the drain voltage does not increase. So, so that in a nutshell, that's a five minute summary of how, how you go about figuring out what the uh, component values will be. Okay, so this is as far as the biasing is concerned. Now, using biasing, uh, we, uh, this is not sufficient. We'll have to figure out how to, uh, how to add signal to it. Now, we, we, we spent a couple of lectures. The large capacitor access is as good as a battery. So we use that, uh, we use that, uh, um, that framework to add our signal 
well one of the plates of the battery of the capacitor acts as a bottom plate of the of the reference plate of, uh, of the battery in series right so we apply this and the value of this capacitor in c1 for c1 to act like a short circuit at signal frequencies we have to ensure that the time constant associated with c1 is much larger than 1 over omega naught and also we have now we turn our attention to the output side we have rl across which we'll have to develop the incremental voltage v naught if we connect this directly then obviously there is a problem because the current through the mosfet is now getting divided between rd and rl which affects the biasing that we don't want to do ideally what we want to do we want to uh, so let's say this is this voltage is vdq and the voltage across rl right the, i mean if we just keep the rl hanging like this the voltage across rl is zero and if i the, the reason it uh, connecting this will not work is because now path and rl uh, so if we want to have current sharing if we don't want to have current sharing then we have to figure out some way of lifting this voltage to vdq one way to do that is simply to add a battery of value vdq and connect these two if i do this then no harm done none of the biasing nothing changes <laughs> battery is floating you cannot use a floating battery what is the other mechanism use a capacitor yeah okay yeah sure so so let me repeat this so the, um, in the last class the way we approach this i didn't mention it in detail i essentially said that you cannot if we add these two up just like just like this, then it will it will be a problem. So what was the solution? Solution was to add a capacitor. So another way of thinking about the capacitor is, is I mean, essentially it's the same thing, but the story told in a different way. Uh, so this value of voltage is VDQ when RL is not added. Now, what is the issue if I add RL directly? There will be current, and this current will cause this change in voltage VDQ. Right, so that can lead the lead to the transistor moving out of saturation, biasing point moving, and so on. A biasing point moving means the GM of the transistor changes. Y two two might not be might not might might not be zero, and so on. So this is not a good thing. So so if I look at the bare bones of it, why is the why is uh, the current getting divided? The current is getting divided because points are not connected. The quiescent value of this and the quiescent value of these voltages are not the same. Right? So if we can make those quiescent values same under the condition that they are not connected as yet under that condition, then connecting those two points will do no harm. There will not be any current through that. Right? So, so that's what, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? You add a battery, you add a battery of VDQ. So this side is still zero, but this side is VDQ. So now if I add a VAT, then no harm done, right? There is no current flow through that blue wire. So the biasing remains as is. But now we know that putting a battery in series is not a good idea. But we have a we have a solution for that. And the solution is putting a capacitor. OK, so uh, putting an infinitely large capacitor will do this job. And I would argue that putting a capacitor is even better than a battery. The reason being, in this case, you don't have to decide what the value of VDQ will be. Right? The, the circuit gives you the value. It will, it will give you the value and charge the capacitor C2 to that appropriate value of VDQ that is required. If you actually have to put a battery, then you have to do multiple experiments, figure out what that value is by opening the circuit and then change the value of the voltage source then connecting in series and so on. In this case, you don't even have to do that. Just that you have to ensure the value of the capacitance is sufficiently large. Now, can you help me out? What is the value of the capacitance which will, which will be sufficiently large in this contraption for C2? Yeah, so I want C2 to act as a short circuit when the input has a frequency of omega omega naught 
how will you go about figuring it out right so like one way to figure out is go by the time period other i mean i would say the easier part uh, method is to figure just find out the time constant associated with c2 so what will be the time constant associated with c2 so rd parallel rl why do you say rd parallel rl rd and rl in series right because if i break it down so this is what it is this is a short this is a short and here you have looking into the drain of the transistor right i am seeing this is the transistor drain so drain of, looking into the drain of the transistor the equivalent impedance is infinite right so so why infinite because this is gm bgs input is shorted so gate is shorted so source is anyway shorted so this is gm bg essentially but gate is shorted so this bg also goes to zero so gm times zero so this goes off right so this goes off so essentially you are left with rd c2 rl so this loop has rd and rl in series with c2 so essentially time constant is c2 times rd plus rl so the as long as you satisfy the condition that c2 times rd plus rl is much greater than 1 over omega naught then uh, the circuit will behave c2 will behave like short circuit at these frequencies right other way to look at it is uh, i mean if i do i mean go this side and that and say c2 times omega naught is much lesser than rd plus rl this is another way of saying that the impedance of this capacitor or the voltage drop of the capacitor will across the capacitor is much lesser than the voltage drop of the equivalent resistor that is connected across it so essentially that means that it, it acts like a short circuit ah, okay so i assume c1 is a short because I mean, the assumption is that you have done a good job in figuring out what the input side should look like right so uh, since he asked this question an important assumption that i made here which is valid in this case is the choice of the value of c1 does not affect the value of k2 and vice versa right that is an inherent assumption that i made right so that assumption is not necessarily always true this is true in this particular circuit because there is no relationship between there is no uh, 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 what I'm, so if the choice of C one will not affect the output side only when you have done a good choice of C one in the sense that only one when you have figured out that part, when you have used the value of C one for which C one acts as a short circuit, right? If C one does not act as a short circuit, then it really doesn't matter, right? Because let's say C one is almost close to zero. Right. If C1 is almost close to zero, then no voltage, no no quiescent, uh, no incremental voltage will couple to the gate, which means there will not be an incremental current this side. If there is no incremental current, there will not be any incremental output voltage. Right. So if C1 is close to zero, or you have not done a good job in figuring out what C1 will be, then figuring out the value of C2 is irrelevant. You you make it C2 as a short or open, it really doesn't matter because nothing is getting coming to the to the output. Now, assuming that C, you have done a good job in figuring out what C1 is, the, and, and then you see that I can only concentrate on C2, right? So we essentially figure out a way of dealing with one capacitor at a time. Because if you think of it, in if you, if you just uh, look at this circuit, which order, in incremental sense, what is the order of your circuit? Total circuit between, from V1 to V0. It's a second order circuit. Right, so it's a second order circuit. So the transfer function should have two values of capacitances. What we all we are doing is that uh, figuring out a way of dealing with one capacitance at a time and not worry about the other one. Okay, and you will see that this is not always true. Uh, that is a story for another day. Okay, so uh, so. Now, I mean, I will not go through this common source amplifier for NMOS in detail because treatment is exactly the same as in case of a PMOS. So I leave it uh, to you and, and hopefully you'll be going through the assignment quickly. Uh, so the next thing that I would like to talk about is 
Even though this circuit seems like it is going to work, so there is one practical issue with this. And you will see this is the theme of the course. I mean, we, I mean, the whole theme of design. Anything you design, there is an issue with it. Uh, just that you have to figure out how to make it better and uh, essentially, uh, essentially say that, okay, I mean, even if the new circuit has some issue, that issue is probably tolerable. Yes. Yes. Why do you say so? Current is not fixed, correct. But VDD is a voltage supply, right? VDQ. Huh, VDQ. Okay. VDQ is not oscillate. VD when I say VDQ, what I essentially mean is uh, 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 quiescent, right? But when the input is changing, clearly VDQ is also changing. That I agree. That that node voltage is changing, but I wouldn't say that to be VDQ. But yeah, go ahead, make your point. Then how does the value of C2 be justified at the time? Like if VDQ is being changed, like how would you actually say that the voltage being that Okay. okay, so if I understand, tell me this is what you are asking or not, right? So his question is, we figured out the value of this capacitance. I mean, the, the whole argument of putting this capacitance was instead of a battery, I mean, I wanted to equalize the two volt, two sides of the capacitances, right? So one way to do was to use a battery. Don't want to use a battery, put a capacitances, then uh, essentially it blocks the DC and it does the job of a battery. Right. So now the, I think his question is, uh, what happens if under the condition that uh, I have voltage swing, which means this is swinging like this, V0 will also swing something like this, but it's not necessary that a voltage swing across the capacitance that is in each plate of the capacitor are same. Right. Is that, is that what you're asking? Okay. So yeah, clearly the voltage swing across either plate of the capacitor will not be identical. Right. So he in this plate it will it will that's my eraser not working. So let's say in this plate it has higher amplitude, in the other plate it has probably slightly lower amplitude. Quite possible. But what decides the yeah. difference in voltages on either plate of the capacitor? Let's say the capacitor is infinitely large. Do you think you will have difference in amplitude of the swing across each plate or at each plate? No, right. Why not? Because impedance is zero at the frequency of omega naught, right? One over omega naught times infinity is zero. So that infinity cannot be realized, just that we are trying to make it as close to infinity as possible or as, uh, as feasible as we can be, right? So, and this is the condition. The impedance of the capacitor should be much lesser than anything that is connected to it. Okay, so uh, so as I was uh, uh, pointing to, there is, there is one issue with this architecture and the issue is, is the following. This is another practical problem, not a, not a theoretical problem. And the practical problem is this. So what is the GM of the transistor? GM of the transistor or Y21 of the transistor is mu n C ox W over L. BGS minus threshold voltage N. <clears throat> so out of this, W by L and BGS Q are designer controllable variables, right? We can set them to pretty accurate values. But what about mu N and what about threshold voltage? So as you see that mu N is a mobility of the transistor which depends, which has to depend on the temperature, right? I mean, uh, it's like a, a, this is an analogy for a resistance. How easily a transistor, how easily charges flow through, through, a, uh, through a piece of semiconductor and the amount of ease, right? Uh, one of the measurement, measures of ease is resistance or in this case, mobility. So uh, then it's easy to, easy to actually, at least intuit that if you change the temperature, if you increase the temperature, there will be more scattering, more os phonon oscillations inside inside a, a piece of semiconductor, which means it will become difficult to move. It's equivalent to if you go to a very busy street where uh, there is no traffic rules, right? So people are going everywhere, so it's very difficult to cut through it. So it's equivalent to that, right? So so temperature increases, chaos increases, it becomes difficult to move, so mu n decreases. I mean that's the intuition. Uh, so so what happens if mu n decreases? 
uh, yeah, mu, mu n uh, changes, let's say, you at room temperature, you figured out the value of gm. Temperature change, mu n change, the value of gm changed, right? So value of gm change, which means your gain has changed, which means you design maybe your amplifier for a gain of 10, it has become a gain of seven or eight or something like that. So, I mean, there will be cascading effects of, the, uh, of this change of gain of one amplifier down the line. Not a good thing. Similarly, uh, threshold voltage, Threshold voltage uh, is all, even though um, the way we have dealt with uh, uh, um, the, the concept of threshold voltage, that's not foolproof. Threshold voltage also changes with, with temperature. In fact, there is a pretty strong dependence of, uh, uh, of uh, threshold voltage, a uh, uh, strong dependence of temperature on threshold voltage. So as a designer, we understand that we cannot control that, the variation of threshold voltage. We cannot control that variation of mobility. That's going to happen. But as a designer, our job is to ensure that even though the temperature changes, even though mu n changes, threshold voltage changes, the performance of the circuit should not change. Right? I mean, expected, right? You use your cell phone, you would like to use your cell phone as efficiently in the month of May as in month of January, even though the temperature probably has changed by 50 degrees. Right, so 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 essentially, that's that's the theme of the next part of uh, of the lecture. So, what should we do to at least make it slightly more robust with GM? We want to make the GM slightly more robust with respect to the changes of threshold voltage and mobility. Okay, okay. So now, uh, now now that we at least uh, understand that there is a need for it, the way to think about it. Uh, way to think about the solution is as follows. So why? Uh, so now let let let's forget about the biasing on the drain side. Let's say this is biased properly. I'm just putting VDD, but uh, since we are only concentrating on GM, assuming that transistor is biased in saturation, I'm not don't want to concentrate on the drain side. Let's only concentrate on on GM. So. So why, uh, at, at the very crux of it, why is uh, GM changing when I am biasing this with a battery of some value, that's a VGSQ? Why do you think, uh, why do you think the GM is changing? I mean, I can understand the expression is giving us this. So going beyond the expression, what is the, uh, uh, what is the fundamental reason? Uh, ah, right. So ultimately, it's the current changing that is causing the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so the current is. So, when I this when I let's say bias a transistor with a battery. That's the threshold voltage change I'm ignoring. Only the mu n change I'm concentrating on. So as you see, if mu n changes, the, tip, the quiescent current itself changes. Since the quiescent current changes, naturally, the GM is going to change, right? So now, if I say that I figure out a way of keeping current constant, how, I don't know. But let's say I figure out a way of keeping current constant, OK? So do you think it will be a better solution to keep the GM same? We'll do that later, but how the answer will come later. But even if we can do that, is it possible to get a circuit which will have a better control of GM? Same IV characteristics, correct. Pardon? No, no, heat will be produced. Mu n is going to change. Right? So what I'm saying is that let's say we find out a magical circuit in which ID does not change. I keep ID constant. How we'll see later. Right? So so what so maybe this figure is uh, misleading. So let's say I have a way. I don't know what is connected to where. All I know is the current ID is constant. I don't know what is connected to where. We'll do that later on. 
Yeah, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you can. We have a constant voltage source, you can also have a current source, right? No, it's constant at loss. Temperature change, okay, think of it in this way. You have a battery, it gives you a constant voltage regardless of temperature, right? Somehow I figured out a way to a constant current using maybe a current source, right? So that the current through I between the drain and the source remains constant. So the new and changes with temperature. New and changes, correct. But I have figured out a way of keeping current constant. Will that be helpful? If it's helpful, then we can go about exploring that option. Pardon? Anything you do, current is constant. That's all I'm saying. I don't know how to do it as yet, but current is constant. Yeah, right. It, it looks like it might work because, and I mean, the reason the GM was changing is because current was changing. If I keep current constant, maybe the GM will not change. Right? But GM is a derived variable, right? The fundamental variable is the current. Question, somebody like question. We can see that if A into B square is constant, then A into B need not be constant. Correct. It need not be, but let's say I am, I, I am not bothering about special voltage change as of now. So let's assume the uh, threshold voltage is not changing, right? So one at a time. Okay, so so let let me ask you this way. Uh, so this part is as he pointed out. I'm taking cue from whatever he said. So this part is constant. Okay, C ox is thickness that doesn't change with temperature. W by L is I decide the geometry doesn't change. VGSQ. I'm not commenting on VGSQ, but let's say the threshold voltage also hasn't changed. Okay. So the threshold voltage hasn't changed. Then under this condition, I, I keep ID cons constant. Do you think it's a better solution for keeping GM constant? It is, right? Because ultimately, if the current doesn't change, then looks like the fundamental variable for which uh, on which the GM was dependent on is not changing, which means at least if I mean if not constant, it should be a better better solution. Okay, so if uh, that is not convincing to you, so let's go ahead with this, and I hope I'll be able to convince you in another fifteen minutes. So so let's assume that we have to keep current constant. Okay, so what is the easiest way to keep a current constant? It use a current source. To keep a voltage constant, you use a voltage source. To keep a current constant, you use a current source, right? So if I push a current I naught, which is equal to ID, pre-calculated value of ID, right? And source is grounded. So one argument can be made that this current will flow into the transistor and keep the current constant regardless of whatever the temperature might be. Right, but do you think this is going to work? In the sense that not with the context of GM same. I'm saying that if I connect a current source like this, will the transistor get biased properly? Why not? Ah, right. So we don't. One thing is we don't know. I I agree that we don't know, but the transistor knows, right? Huh? This would work. Okay. Why do you say it will work? Ah, exactly. Right. It's the essentially you have to see the way I have connected it. This current has nowhere else to flow. It will flow into the transistor. But we don't know whether the transistor will be honoring the biasing state. Right? So that is something we have to figure out because we need the transistor to be in saturation to get gain. Right? So that is a primary condition. We want that not only we want current to flow, constant current to flow, but we also want to ensure that the transistor remains in saturation. Okay. So 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 the even before going ahead with this. Let me state a very obvious thing the, that should be pretty obvious by now. In this case, in, in, in a transistor, VGSQ 
there are two things. One is the VGS and one is ID. Among these two, which one is the dependent variable? Which one is the independent variable? ID is the dependent variable. VGS is the independent variable, right? You change VGS to get ID, right? It's not necessary that you change ID. The VGS will automatically change. Even though that's not particularly visible from the equation. Because I can always write VGS as threshold voltage plus under root to ID by mu n C ox W Y L. Right? I can do change of variables. Maths doesn't will not tell you which is the dependent and which is the independent. I mean, you can always do left side and the right side of the equation. But the device knows. Right? The, that's the difference between algebra and engineering. Okay, so your current is the dependent independent variable, VGS is the dependent variable, and that causes that is the problem that we are grappling with here. Okay, so now just I connect your current so like my current source like this, it, it's not necessary that it's going to work. So if it's not necessary, so we have to figure out a way to make it work. Why won't it work? Okay, so uh, so let me ask you this. Why do you think it's going to work? Then I'll tell you that. Because I not is going to flow. I agree. Then, but do you ensure that current is transistor is in saturation? If we choose a correct I not, okay. What do you mean by cho choosing a correct I not? There is also capacitor, so. Uh, there is no capacitor is not be relevant here because we are talking about DC at yeah, DC capacitor is essentially open. Right? So VGS is at the right one. Ah, right. We don't yet have VGS. I haven't connected anything. So do you want me to connect a VGS? Right. We have to connect a VGS, right? So, okay. Now we're in the right direction. So we are connect a battery VGS Q. Okay. So now we do our math. And we figured out for some appropriate value of VGSQ, I need some IDQ and I connect a current source and I connect a voltage source. Correct? The transistor will be biased. I agree. So now let's say temperature changed slightly. You did all these calculations in 20s at room, room temperature. Now temperature changed. Mobility changed. What happens now? Why not? VGS is, is fixed. Battery. VGS ah, right. So you said it don't work. Yeah, fine. VGS will remain constant. The temperature change and the amount of current that the transistor is allowed to flow will change. But we are supplying Great, right? Excellent. So that that's essentially the problem, right? What? Exactly, right? We have multiple modes of saturation condition. That's what is going to happen. So let me take one at a time. The point that he was making is, so let's say I figured out, I'm, let me take a number so it's easier to deal with numbers. So let's say this was two volt. Social voltage, let's say is one volt. It isn't changing. Um, this current was initially one milliamp. And I did the math and figured out this is the condition at room temperature, right? And let's say room temperature decreased. So mobility may be increased. So at a, at a slightly higher value of mobility, the requirement of the current for the transistor increased from 1 milliamp to 1.1 milliamp. That is a requirement. OK, but I have a current source from the top. The guy is not able to provide 1.1 1, 1 milliamp. So what's going to happen? Right, exactly. The shifting in the region, right? So now. Which side would the region try to shift to? Yeah, why linear? Because you cannot change this current. This current is fixed. The only way to match the current from the top to current from the bottom is to change the current that the dependent source is pulling out. Right? So only way, and the transistor is in saturation. If the transistor is in saturation, the current is not dependent on anything on the output side. It's only dependent on VGSQ. Correct. So the only way to reduce the, to, for the transistor to meet this criteria, the way we have set up the circuit, 
is to push itself from linear to uh, saturation to linear region. Right? Because when we move, move from saturation to linear, the dependence on this voltage arrives. Right? V, it becomes transistor current becomes dependent on VDS. And since it becomes dependent on VDS, that voltage can move down. This voltage can move down so as to change this current from 1.1 1, 1 .1 to 1 million. Yeah, I'll come to the other point. I'll come to the other condition later, right? So at least under this condition, you understand, do you agree that the transistor cannot be in saturation? Correct? So what is it that's going to happen? Essentially, if you observe this voltage, maybe at room temperature, when you had connected 1 milliamp and 2 volt, everything was fine. This, this voltage was, I'm just taking a value. Let's say this was 2 volt also. But you change temperature, the requirement of the current from the transistor increased. So essentially, you are pull, trying to pull out more current from a node than you are pushing in. Right? So transistor is also a dependent current source. So you are trying to pull out more current than you are pushing in. So this voltage has to drop. Right? The intermediate voltage has to drop. And it will drop till that till the time or till the condition where these two currents match. These two currents match. Since this is fixed, this cannot change. Only way to match is this current has to reduce. And that will happen by when this voltage drops, the dependence of the current in the transistor on the drain voltage will start arriving. And the moment the dependence of, of the current in the transistor, uh, or rather, let me rephrase. So the moment the current in the transistor gets dependent on the drain to source voltage, you know it's in linear region, right? Because in saturation, there is no dependence on the drain to source voltage. Right? Okay. So, so now what happens to the other, other case? As you are pointing out, uh, that let's say uh, temperature increased and the requirement of ID decreased. Instead of going to 1.1, it went to 0.9. I think this is what you are trying to point out, right? So what's going to happen to this intermediate voltage? What's going to happen to this voltage? Yeah, it's not, but even before going there, can you comment on it? That voltage is going to decrease or increase the drain voltage. It is going to increase, right? You are you are push, pull, pulling out less current that you are pushing into a node, right? And it's almost like an infinite impedance node, right? So that voltage is going to keep on increasing. So under the condition that I have shown here, this voltage is going to go to infinity, right? But we know that's not true. That's not possible. That is, in that case, we'll have to figure out, can the current source work if that voltage keeps on going high? And in fact, it doesn't. Because later on, you will see that current sources are also made using transistors. So you have to honor the saturation condition for the current source. So this, that current source will, will essentially go out of saturation. And the current will, will, again, the circuit will stabilize when the current source is not able to provide that. OK. So, so, so now. The, I mean, the summary of whatever we discussed discuss till now is we want a constant current bias, right? We want a constant current bias, but if I put a constant current source here and a voltage source at the gate, between the gate and the source, it's not going to work because in this circuit, we are trying to impose two independent variables, right? Current source is an independent variable. VGS is an independent variable. We are, we are putting them together and asking the transistor, match yourself. That's not going to happen. It's like having two bosses, right? One is saying something, other is saying something, what do you do? Basically, don't work. It's, that's what is happening. So, so we need one boss. Uh, in this case, we need one uh, independent source, which means that we, since we need constant current source, that has to be the independent source of choice. Okay, so, so we cannot compromise on this. This has to be there. But then the question comes back as to what to do with VGS. Okay, so so let me put back that voltage source again, and let's say I take you to the lab and say that this is the circuit. I don't want to com compromise on I naught. I don't want to compromise on 
the, on, on the transistor, get me a way of ensuring this guy is biased in saturation, right? So essentially what I'm saying is this is the black box. You can observe this voltage. Uh, this is grounded, doesn't matter. You can observe gate voltage. You can observe drain voltage. You can observe source voltage. Tell me an algorithm, right? You can tweak whatever you want physically. Tell me an algorithm which will help me bias the transistor in saturation all the time. So what are you going to observe and what are you going to change? So step one is essentially that's what it's going to lead to. So, so step one, I the one that we already did, right? We did some calculation, figured out this value of I naught requires this value of VGS, two volt, one milliamp, and we hooked it up. Change the temperature doesn't work. So now what are you going to do? You can change anything. You are sitting in the lab, ESC 201 lab with all multimeters, voltage sources, everything. No, I didn't say VGS is constant. I'm saying that this voltage is controllable. This is your, this is accessible to you. You can choose to connect a battery. You can choose to connect anything. You can choose to connect a variable battery, whatever you want. That that voltage is, node is accessible. I, this is, yeah, inside the box, nothing can change. Outside the box, everything can change. So we can have more. This actual voltage is this as for the new like or uh, when the new one changes. Okay, what will that model be? Kind of feedback model where if the new one is no, no, you are thinking too much like a think you are in the lab and you're doing scrappy things, right? What do you do in the lab? You keep changing things till you want the output, you get the output, right? You don't think of models. <laughs> But why will capacitor help? You are talking about biasing, right? Capacitor will be infinite. Ah, basically, it will not allow current to flow this time, but it will cause of VD, VG minus VD to be some. You mean v, between VG and VD? Uh -huh. This, is it? Yes. So, why will that help? That's true, but you have to charge the capacitor initially to something. What value do you want to charge it to? Okay, which are then then what happens? But still, I mean, this voltage is constant, isn't it? We are talking about biasing, so the voltage is still. I mean, how is this going to help? Ah, correct, right? So yeah, so what he is trying to point out is, I'll come to what you what you are saying has a nugget of truth that can work under some condition, but I'll come to it later. So. Even before putting a capacitor, let's say, uh, again, I mean, you are thinking too much in, in, the, in a theoretical perspective. Think again, go back to your days of when you were doing, I mean, even I think you were doing 203 lab, right? So let's say you have to match something, you know the expected output. What do you do? Let's put a register. Forget register, man. Just tell me, I mean, what do you do in the lab? You don't put register, right? You keep tweaking the inputs till you get down. That's all you do, right? <laughs> so that's what we are going to do here. <laughs> we know that current I naught needs to flow. I figured out a way of connecting it up. And it's not going to, it's not, I'm, I'm seeing that the transistor is not in saturation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change VGS. This will put a variable voltage source. I'll keep changing it till I get the output, right? So now the question is, how do I figure out the transistor is in saturation or not? Pardon? Correct, right? So by observing VD, by observing the uh, the drain voltage, right? So if I know this, I this I'm applying, this voltage I'm applying, I know what that voltage is. If I observe VD and see that the saturation condition is satisfied, then I know the transistor is fine, right? So now I'm walking, let me walk you through what the thought process is. I mean, even if I give you a transistor and this, this is what you are going to do in the lab, even though you were sitting here and thinking of something else. So, so what are you going to do? This is a black box. Let's say you don't know what's inside, right? This is wiped out. You know that this is the configuration. You can't see that. 
So what's going to happen? You are going to observe VD. And let's say for two volt, you observe that the value of VD is, I don't know, maybe 0.9 volt. And given the threshold voltage is one volt. So what is happening? The transistor is, it's a linear region, right? So what, what is the conclusion? What do you need to do to get the transistor back in saturation? Decrease VV, VG, right? Decrease this two volt. You have to decrease this two volt. So when you decrease this two volt, this voltage is going to increase. Correct? And moment it, I mean, you get the saturation condition, you said the transistor is biased properly. Okay. So now what is, again, what is the thought process? The thought process is, uh, even though you're observing this output voltage and trying to see what, what's go, whether it is uh, matching the saturation condition or not, actually what you were trying to see is, what you are trying to argue with yourself is whether this current is matching this current or not, right? So if these two currents match, I mean, uh, while keeping the transistor in saturation, then VD will be somewhat stabilized, right? Uh, but if, let's say, if the current through M1, the requirement of current through M1 increases, then this VD is going to decrease. If the requirement of current through M1 increases, Sorry, the other way around. If the requirement of current through M1 increases, the VD is going to decrease. But if the requirement of current through M1 decreases, the VD, VD, VD is going to increase. Right? So essentially, you are trying to figure out, you are trying, you are observing VD. The VD is the value of the voltage VD is a proxy to figure out whether the strength of the current source are matching or not. Okay. So now, again, so what is the algorithm? The algorithm is, if VD decreases, I need to decrease VG, correct? So if VD decreases, so let me write it here. If VD decreases, then decrease VG, VGQ. And obviously the other one is also true. If VD increases, then increase VGQ. This is what I am going to do in the lab. Right? So what is the easiest way to implement this in a circuit? Pardon? No, no. Dependent source is, is another thing, right? So yes, feedback fine. But let's say again, you are thinking in terms of theory. What is the easiest way? If Yeah, when this increases, I'm increasing this. When this decreases, I'm decreasing this. Just connect those two. Right? So thus connect those two. Let's see. Let's see. So now, uh, now what's going to happen? Let's say uh, mobility change. What's going to happen? So if the threshold, if, if the mobility change and the requirement of this current reduced, let's say this the requirement of this current became one, I don't know, maybe 1.1 milliamps. So what's going to happen to this voltage? This voltage will try to? No, no, requirement of the current. You did the cal calculations under quiescent conditions and you figured that the current of one milliamp was required. No, right? You are trying to pull out more current. It will try to decrease, right? But moment it tries to decrease, it is trying to decrease the VGS also. Right? So essentially, its dependence has been shifted. The dependence of the drain voltage has been shifted to the gate voltage. So if the transistor can reduce the VGS and adjust its own strength without moving out of saturation. So what will happen if the current is by the Okay, so 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 now okay, so let me show it in one minute in a mathematical format. So you remember I wrote the current, uh, wrote the VGS as threshold voltage plus two I naught by mu n C ox W over L. Yes. Right. So so what's going to happen here? What the so if 
if your requirement, if mu n changes, right? If mu n changes, so this, this term is going to change. But because that term is changing, the VGS is also changing. Because VGS, I, by putting a feedback between drain and gate, right? I have introduced a way of making I naught to be the dependent variable and VGS to be the, sorry, I naught to be the independent variable and VGS to be the dependent variable. Right, I'm generating VGS from I naught. So still I have only one boss, right? Only one dependent variable, independent variable. So I naught fixes the VGS. So now you don't have that problem of VGS is asking you to drive some other I naught and I naught is providing something else. Right, does that make sense? No? Okay, so we'll talk about it in the next class then. So, okay, let's talk about that offline, right? They're out of time, after, maybe after five minutes, right? <clears throat> so